what you're doing It's time for 101 I know we've all got a lot going on But let's try to make this painless and fun If that's even possible in 2021 Let's get this done At the end of Zoom We'll come, we'll have vaccination We'll have vaccinations and stimulus checks We'll have a spring break Why does Ted Cruz get to go to Cancun? We'll have a flunk day And like Ari Aster, we'll get 24 A's Tomorrow might be flunk day But right now it's not So you've got a class to take Hey everyone How's it going? Welcome back to EMVS 101. Who's ready to talk about food? I am always ready to talk about food, so today should be good. I want to talk about the supply side, the production side of food in the United States. We've talked about our own consumption choices and how even though there's no perfectly ethical consumption choice that we can make, there are some consumption choices that are better for the environment than others. But why do we have the choices that we have? Where are these choices coming from and who is providing them? Today, I want to look at the system that gives us our food. How does it work? Whose voices get listened to and whose voices don't get listened to? And why do we end up with the choices that we get? And I want to make the argument that there's an environmentally destructive equilibrium that we've settled into because of the political forces in the United States. So we're doing things every day in agriculture that provide us with food at the cost of environmental quality. And the reason we keep making that choice day after day is because we're stuck in an equilibrium in a system that was generated by political forces hundreds of years ago. So let's talk about Food. The agricultural system in the United States is increasingly concentrated and increasingly mechanized. Food is industrial. This means that agriculture is really intensive. It relies on a lot of chemical inputs and energy inputs that require fossil fuels or require other environmentally destructive proceed. Let me circle back around and try that again. Procedures. Nailed it. So that's what I want to talk about today. I also want to show you this picture of an American food aisle in a UK supermarket. I thought you'd be interested to see how other countries around the world see your cuisine. So you can see all of the great achievements of American food and cuisine in these shelves. You want American food? Oh, you must mean these. Twinkies, Goober Jam, Jif Peanut Butter. All the great foods. The only things that are missing here are maybe the um, KFC Double Down. This is, this is good, right? This is, you're into this. Where does all this amazing food come from? I will say, like, deep fried Oreos. You know, people can say what they want about America. I don't care. This is the greatest country in the world. Deep fried Oreos are amazing. So how did agriculture in the US get to this mechanized, industrialized state? Well, it's always been a big sector of the US economy. Back in 1869, just after the Civil War, the agricultural sector made up over a third of the US GDP. And you can see here, uh, in the early 20th century, the states where that was most concentrated. It's declined a lot since then. It's down to around 1% of the US GDP. So it's declined from over 30, almost 40%, down to one, less than 1% of the US economy. And this isn't because less land is being used or that agriculture is less productive. Actually, agricultural production has increased six times over since the early 1900s. It's just that every other sector of the US economy has been growing much faster than agriculture. Over the same period of time, farms and agricultural productivity moved increasingly southwest and became a lot more concentrated. So this chart looks a little hard to read, but there's actually some really important information in there. If you focus on the left hand of the y-axis and the dotted line, this measures the number of farms in the US from 1850 uh, up through the early 2000s. And so you can see there's around 2 million farms in 1850, and it climbs and it climbs and it climbs and it climbs until the 1930s, when it hits almost 7 million farms in the US, and then it declines a lot. You can see that the total land area of those farms climbs at about the same rate, and then it levels off 
So as the number of farms declines from, let's say, the, the sort of Great Depression of the 1930s all the way through the early 2000s, from its peak of almost 7 million down to almost where it was back in the 1800s of around 2 million. While that decline has been happening, the overall amount of land used for farms has actually stayed fairly static. That's the right-hand y-axis. Around 2 million square miles are being used for farming in 1920, and it's around 1.5 in 2000, so it hasn't really gone down that much. So when you put those two numbers together, you get that chart in the middle. Land per farm has skyrocketed. So farms have become a lot bigger. We have fewer of them now than we had in the early 20th century, but the ones that you do have are a lot bigger. So this increase in concentration was accompanied by very uh, increased specialization in farms, increased standardization across farms, and more mechanization. So specialization means most farms only make one product or a very small number of products. So rather than having one farm that provides all your eggs, all your butter, all your cheese, all your corn, all your tomatoes, these are all the foods I can name, I could keep going. That's just how many foods I know. Instead of that, you just have one farm that makes all of the eggs for everyone in the country. You have one farm that makes all of the corn for everyone in the country, etc, etc, etc. That's why Illinois has tons of corn, tons of soybeans. They're really specialised farms. They're also really standardised. Instead of farmers tailoring their techniques to all of the different things that they're making, there's sort of one standardised seed that is really widely used, a couple of standardised fertilisers that are really widely used. And this is really efficient, but it can be really bad for the environment. This map shows the uh, what's called the, the sort of die-off in Louisiana, in the Gulf of Mexico, where all of the fertilizer that gets used in farms in Iowa and Illinois and Wisconsin seeps into the Mississippi, gets carried all the way down the Mississippi, and pollutes the entire Gulf of Mexico. Not only have there been these local pollution problems, but agriculture in the US, because it's so specialized, standardized, and mechanized, like you can't do anything without a $20,000 tractor, this is releasing 90 million tons of CO2 per year. It's led to deforestation across the US, it uses 70% of the world's fresh water. That's so much fresh water! And it's also led to these monocultures, these single crop farms that are vulnerable to infection. In some sense, this environmentally destructive equilibrium is not a good way for agriculture to be. Even farmers who are working really hard to take care of their land, to take care of their animals, and to take care of the environment are stuck in this system that puts a massive amount of competitive pressure on them. They're competing with these massive farms that can do, generate like really low prices because they're only focused on one thing and they've got huge economies of scale. So it's really hard for farmers to avoid getting trapped in this environmentally destructive equilibrium. One of the reasons that this is the case is because it was a deliberate choice by US politicians. So whether it was the land-grant colleges from the 1860s that helped spread environmentally uh, destructive but agriculturally and economically productive messages, and those extension agents, or whether it's the subsidies that the US uses to help stabilize prices and in encourage like large farms, there have been like conscious political choices that have led to the US agricultural sector looking the way that it does. Illinois, by the way, is still a big recipient of the US government subsidies that help big farms stay big. If we look at the history of these policies, then one of the really important ones to know about is the 1933 Agricultural Adjustment Act that uses subsidies to stabilize prices. The basic idea here is that weather changes and farmers have to be really sensitive to that. They can't always produce the amount that they were hoping to, and that's just because of the weather. If there's floods, or if there's a drought, no matter how much corn you plant, you might not have enough at the end of the year. Now, this is a situation that governments and businesses really want to avoid. In order to counteract that, you subsidize farmers to plant more than they think they're going to need, so that hopefully you don't run into this nightmare scenario of not having enough food to go around. So, the Agricultural Adjustment Act guarantees prices and farmers in return agree to stick to growing the same amount each year so that the government and other businesses can be relatively sure 
that even if price, even if the weather changes and suddenly everyone's got like a bumper crop and prices go way down and then farmers want to plant less, that, that we can be relatively sure that there's going to be a reliable food supply. So those subsidies were introduced in the 1930s in a very different economy to try to help with that potential problem. Subsidies were based on production, so bigger farmers got more, wage-earning labourers were excluded, and African Americans were often excluded from this act. So it really concentrated the ownership of agricultural capital into a very small number of hands. And that's still really true today. Once you start issuing subsidies, and once you go down this political path, it's really hard to get off it. This leads to people getting stuck in um, an equilibrium, in a situation that isn't working for them, and isn't working for the environment. But because it's hard to take away people's subsidies, it's going to be really hard to get off this path. So even though the uh, vast majority of people in the US don't benefit from these subsidies, because there's a few politically powerful members of Congress whose constituents really do benefit from these subsidies, it's difficult to see political change within the current system that we're in. Lobbying is another reason why this situation is the way that it is. There are a few big agricultural companies that have made up some of the largest lobbying efforts seen in the US, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars targeting the Department of Agriculture. Now, I think it's easy to get too pessimistic about campaign finance as a specific source of all of the problems with US politics. Often people say, you know, if we could just get money out of politics, that would really help a lot. I think that there are lots of other things wrong with US politics, no offense. Uh, so although this lobbying like does seem to help generate like a lot of stickiness with a situation that isn't working that well. There's a lot more going on here, so I don't want this to be seen as like a simple lobbying bad change good type of story. There are lots of other countries around the world that don't have the US's specific lobbying problem, but still have this environmentally destructive agricultural sector. Part of why this is the case is because people have a very outdated idea of what farming is. Way back to Thomas Jefferson, there's been this idea that, uh, quote, those who labour in the earth are the chosen people of God. That having farmers in your country, that it's just like a wholesome profession. They're clomping around with big boots, naming animals, getting up early in the morning, just generally being cool people. And while that may be true for a lot of people, there are lots of people working on farms whose lives don't necessarily look like that. But there's still this idea that uh, rural farms are the backbone of America. There was a sticker that I saw somewhere downtown in Galesburg that said, uh, men in denim built this country, men in suits have ruined it. And there was a picture of a farmer like chewing an ear of corn. I would argue that every word of that sentence is wrong, but I think that's a sort of common sentiment that farmers have more political power than just their numbers would imply, because people think that they sort of have a, uh, a better like moral compass than people who are maybe corrupted by living in the cities amongst all that decadence and luxury. This has been a really common trope throughout ju not just US history, but lots of countries in the world. Interestingly, there's no real correlation between having a good democracy and having a rural economy. Spain, Portugal, and Greece all had large agricultural sectors, and it didn't stop them from having dictatorships in the 20th century. There are lots of other countries that have agricultural economies and are very democratic and are very not democratic. So there doesn't really seem to be a lot of evidence that having a thriving agricultural sector helps you stay a democracy. But I think this is still another important idea that together with lobbying and the economic incentives that all people working in agriculture face, the competition that they face, this helps keep the food sector in the US in an environmentally destructive state. Now let's change gears and talk about weed. So the article that you read last week talks about an entirely different agricultural product, namely marijuana. And it argues that this can be a way for young people to start relating to the environment in a positive way, even if they don't get out of doors much. So I'm interested in a few things in this article. So one of the interesting quotes, at least for me, was, increasingly many youth are disconnected from the natural world, rather 
they inhabit a technological world. Do you all agree with this? Is this just an older person writing about how, like, millennials are killing the environment? Or do you think there's something to be said for this idea that people are spending too much time on their phones, and that anything that gets you out of doors, even if it's a drug that's still a federal crime, can actually have, like, a good effect on your relationship with the environment? I also wanted to ask, where's the discussion of race and gender in this article? Might people have different experiences with marijuana or with other drugs or like going into the woods uh, to get high, depending on their race and gender? Does the article touch on this at all? What are your thoughts? And then what do we think the long-term implications are if this is a formative experience for you in the environment? Just to give some context to that debate, I think it's worth saying that black people are around four times more likely than white people to be arrested for marijuana possession, that marijuana convictions still make up only a small minority of people who are incarcerated, but that even arrests that don't end in incarceration still really drastically change a person's life trajectory. And so even though Illinois, when it legalised marijuana, did make some efforts to expunge the records, of people who'd been convicted of marijuana possession in the past, there's still a lot, a long history of racial disparities in the way that the drug laws in the US are enforced. So maybe when white environmentalists talk about how they had a really positive experience going into the woods and smoking weed, what does that say about the issues that they care about? Does that make people of colour feel heard and included in the environmental movement? It's also worth thinking about how marijuana laws are still implemented in racist ways, not only towards black people, but also towards immigrants. If you're applying for a green card and there's any evidence that you went to a dispensary or that you worked in a dispensary or earned money there, then that can be seen as what's uh, called the like good moral character test. So even though it's legal, a different set of rules seem to be being applied to people depending on their country of origin. Even though it's been quote-unquote legalised, the law has still not been applied equally. Hopefully this gives you a little bit more background on why the agricultural sector is the way that it is, and the ways that it's currently hurting the environment, even as it's providing for some really important basic needs for people. I think this leaves us with a thorny issue. How do you reform a sector that's stuck in the political mud, much like a tractor might be stood in, stuck in the physical mud. And how do you get off a path that the US policymakers have been on for a long time? Especially because no country in the world has really solved this problem. Um, I also wanted to show you this picture I took that was, uh, I think, a really beautiful look at one of the cornfields in Galesburg, uh, except for the graffiti on the traffic barrier. Some people have no respect. So, uh, thank you very much for watching this presentation. I look forward to hearing your comments on the reading, um, both for last week and for this week, in our discussion. Um, but yeah, cheerio!